Thank you, Lina, and thank you, Martin, and thank you, Daniel, to make this happen and inviting me, and thank you to the Royal Academy. And I have now the very easy task to, within half an hour, to explain you how we fix all this mess with the nutrients. So this is an easy task. Um, my talk will be a little bit different because I have to talk about also the land, but I hope that especially people from the agencies and Robert that you said, we need a land sea perspective to fix this problem. I, and I will talk about more on land. But to my background is uh, marine biology chemistry, and I worked a lot also in, in, in river catchments. But I'm ignorant on agricultural science, so please explain, uh, excuse me if I'm a little bit radical if I go into these agricultural budgets, but I do it as a marine biogeochemist. And I would also like to thank you, Oleg Savchuk, Michelle McCracken, and Bu Gustafsson, that, of course, uh, it was part of our team, and uh, we're also contributing to, to this talk. So what I will do is managing low oxygen zones in the Baltic seas, of course, managing the nutrients. And uh, I will do a quick review about the current status of the eutrophication management, uh, what is, what is the, 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 the history of the Baltic Sea Action Plan. I will talk about the measures on land, because here the management action uh, has to be to come place. Then I will a little bit elaborate on what is ecosystem recovery, because we have a slow reacting system, and for us it's a problem. We do a lot, but there's not a big change. How do we convey that? This is a big problem we have in this system. And then there's, especially in Sweden and in Finland, there are these sea-based measurements. They are discussed and heavily discussed also in the agencies, at the department and the ministry. So I think we have to address that. And then, Finally, I would like to also throughout the talk, I think this is the red line, is how to convey success when degradation is considered irreversible in management timescales. Because we look back 50 years ago and want to have a Baltic Sea that was 50 years ago, but we have to wait 50 years, that Daniel said just. This is not easy. And within 100 years, we will not have the same ecosystem. This is clear to everybody. But how do we convey that to the public? And I think this is a little bit what I want to elucidate here in during this talk. So many of you have been this thousand times, but some of you don't. So the, the current status of eutrophication status is still the eutrophication section of the Baltic Sea Action Plan. It was in 2007. All ministers of environment signed this, this agreement that not more than about 600,000 tons of nitrogen and 21,000 tons of phosphorus should really enter the Baltic Sea. And this was really a blueprint, I would say, a really a big step forward because it was really based on scientific advice and it was really science meets management. And the background for that was that, and this has been updated in the year 2013, and now I think there is also a further update now, 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 uh, um, terminated. And but what was behind that? And I think this is also very basic, but there was a group of experts in Helcom, and these are people from the agencies, and some of, of us scientists sitting there and saying, what, what do we want? We want to have clear water. We want to have an increased transparency. We don't want to have these, these, these algae here. But there was no discussion in the, in the society, what kind of Baltic Sea do we want to have? It is not arbitrary, but they said we want to have an increase in transparency by one and a half meters. In, 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 in. And this has been then translated into uh, this, this, this re report and then translated into variables. We want to have these dissolved organic nitrogen concentrations in the various basins, phosphate, chlorophyll, and the increase in secchi depth. But this is expert knowledge, and this is about the status of the Baltic Sea in the 50s, 60 years ago. But, there, but is, it, is it achievable at all with our lifestyle? There's no discussion on that. So this is the background. And what we then did here in Stockholm and with our team is with the, using this Baltic Nest model, which is an, is an, is an Earth system model on a regional scale, uh, um, uh, describing the input of nutrients from the atmosphere, but also from the watershed to the system. It addresses here in red, you see here the anoxia, of course, the transformation of nutrient phosphorus and carbon in this system and oxygen, of course. And this model has been run until the, the targets has been met, so to say. So, and then this was, and this, everything happened in 2007, very intense. And this was mediated by Helcom in, 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 in Finland. And 
The next step was then, okay, we had the total load of nutrients from the atmosphere, which is only 20%, most of it's from rivers, and we had then the maximum allowable input. This was this 600 versus 20,000 tons, and the rest is needed reduction. And then it really became a little bit, yeah, very interesting for us. I was, this was done by Frederick Rolf, the professor, the, who, who really was driving that, and I was uh, traveling with him very often. And then we had to, to distribute these needed reductions, and Helcom was the mediator, and there came many uh, suggestions how to do that. The Russians came up and said this has to be done in relation to the length of the coastline because they don't have a long coast, but this, I mean, it makes sense. And uh, there were many suggestions how we should do it, but then we said, okay, we, we ask EMAP, the, the group there, they will take us a little bit about the atmospheric uh, um, uh, transports from non-Halcom countries, and then we calculated how much comes from the Netherlands and from uh, the UK, and this is the total load, this is the non-repairing country load, this is then the Halcom load. And then we could, could, could say, what is the share? And here Poland is, is the big, big contributor of that. 60% comes from Poland of nutrients to the Baltic Sea. And then we said simply, this is the needed reductions times the share, what they bring in today, is then the country allocation. And the minister signed that. This is not, this can be discussed, of course, because especially for Sweden, because the people said, we don't have the knowledge what of all these loads to the Baltic Sea is background load and what is anthropogenic. We, I think we know it today. But it's a little bit unfair to a country like Sweden, which has a lot of forest and background load and cannot do so much about it. Uh, the is the Dane sitting there, which has a lot of, um, a lot of pigs and, uh, and agriculture who can do more about it or not. But this hasn't been taken into account. But I think today we could do it uh, with the with what is the anthropogenic part of it. Okay, what happens since this? And we have seen this curve before, but here now I have put in here a line. This is then the, the, um, the updated upper limit, and this is a little bit higher because it's now also um, um, atmospheric depositions. We see the total, this is river load plus atmospheric, and we see we have almost there in nitrogen, and we are, have done a huge, really, Success story from almost 70,000 tons, and we did a lot of cleaning and sewage and so on, and now we are about eight to 10,000 tons to go. It's still to go. And, um, but we have done, and this you don't see it in any other area. Uh, Denise, I think you give me right if you look at the Mississippi Basin. They are not these changes. In China, we see increases. In the North Sea, we might see increases, uh, decreases in, in phosphorus, not so much in nitrogen. This is really a success. This, had, this is and maybe in the, in, the, in the Black Sea, but there it is due to an economic crush, so to say. But this is really exceptional on a global scale. So I would say it is a success story. And what we have to do still here is the, um, this is now the bars, gives now the, the, the total load and the dot here. This gives the, 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 the Helcom goal. And we see here in Sweden and, and in Denmark even, we, 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 and this is in terms of, of, of phosphorus, because again, what we said before and also what Andrea said before, as similar as the global ocean, the Baltic Sea is nitrogen limited in the spring bloom, but phosphorus controlled due to the cyanobacteria blooms. But what we see here, in the Baltic proper and the Gulf of Riga and the Gulf of Finland, we still have to do, let's say, seven, 8,000 tons phosphorus. And this is not so much, but it is huge because we have to do something uh, uh, significant here. So the, this is the status of the, of the, and these are the latest numbers here from the progress for, uh, for the phosphorus targets. So now we, I mean, we'll, as a marine scientist, we'll talk about agriculture, and I hope there will be not so many agriculture um, persons here. But here are all these measures that we can do. And I know that in Denmark, for example, this really led to an, an, an improvement of the situation, the storage of manure. They, and with that, Denmark could reduce their fert inorganic fertilizer inputs by 50% to do a better job on that stuff. We have buffer strips, we have even technique that we have, the farmers have GPS and maps on, uh, gridded maps on their fields and they have a radar here and they can see how much they have to fertilize in this area, they, they measure the greenishness of, of the area and so on. So, and the big thing is also pelleting of, of, of manure. But these, all the measures, we, we know them all, but we can apply, we have to apply them. And what I will use now a lot is this term of nutrient use efficiency. And this is simply the, the ratio between the crops 
uh, taken out, retrieved from, from an agriculture area over the, what we put in in terms of manure and inorganic fertilizer. So as an example, I retrieved 70 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare in terms of crops, and I put in 100 before in terms of nitrogen, and then I have a ratio of 70, something like that. Okay, um, here, this is now a recent study from our group here from Annika Swambeck here, came out last month. We have here on the bars, these are the inputs of, uh, in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus, two agricultural fields in terms of fertilizer, crop fixation and deposition. And um, what we see here, and manure, what we see here, and the dots is the crop demand. So we've seized, first of all, we heavily over-fertilize all these systems, and this is per country. For the whole catchment, we over-fertilize, we, 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 we put in double as much as we need. And this is, this, and, and it's been in countries like, key countries like, for example, Poland, you see only with the manure here, we could theoretically meet the needs of the crops. But we put on more. We put on double as much. And even in China, you do that three times as much. They don't stop with that. But it is all about management. And here, this is in terms of phosphorus. You see it here. For example, uh, countries like Denmark with this pig production, of course, they could use um, a lot for their crop needs only from manure. But they, and, but they don't do so much in, in terms of inorganic fertilizer. But Belarus, they meet the needs with, with, with uh, manure, but they add more than double as much of this. This is practices that can be improved relatively easily. And the big elephant in the room, if you talk about um, eutrophication, is all the time the, the, the uh, animal production. And we have 85 million people in the Baltic, 23 million uh, pigs, 250 million chicken, and 60 million cows. These, they emit much more. But and this is here from a uh, um, um, publication from Clark and Tillman that they say especially dairy is really is a high risk for eutrophication. But what is also from this recent publication, the higher the, density, the livestock density is in an area in the countries, the more is the agricultural surplus because the farmers have heavily livestock production. This is wanted by the EU because they want to have specialized agriculture in, in livestock production and crop production. And the farmers don't know how to get rid of it. It is voluminous, you cannot transport it, and they put it th there where they produce it. And where there you have the surpluses, there you have the leakage. You see it here for phosphorus. And this causal relationship continues here because of the agricultural surplus translates to riverine loads here by basins. So the more the agricultural surplus, the more loads to the sea, and this is driven by, 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 by meat production, you could say. And um, we have done now together with uh, Bob Howarth Group in Cornell, we have done a detailed agricultural budget and they have done lots of this accounting and so on. This was too much for me as a marine scientist, but they have done all these things. And they have done a budget for the entire catchment for the Baltic Sea, very detailed. So they went through all these FAO data sets on a nuts to level, very detailed. And this is the, uh, the aggregated numbers. Here we have the feed import into the catchment we have the uh, fertilizer import to the catchment. Here we have the, 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 uh, uh, the output. And this you can get from statistical books. And then we do simply a budget on what happened, how are this recycled in the system. And the key numbers here are 70% of all crops we produce in the Baltic Sea area is just for feeding animals, nothing else. 70%. This is huge. And the same in the Mississippi, it's everywhere the same. It's only 30% for our consumption. And then that the manure production is three to four times higher than human excretions. So if you want to do something on the nutrient management of the body, see, we have to focus on manure production. It's a lot of poop. It's a lot. 1.8 million tons of shit is produced there, which is a lot. What we think is, if we could, theoretically, we could do from a biochemical budget, reduce the fertilizers by 1 million to 1.7 million tons. It's a lot. And if we, but what does it mean for the Baltic? And here we can use, but first of all, uh, we, we, we look again to the detailed numbers. We have a crop production of 2.4 million tons in terms of nitrogen units. We input 1.9 almost in, in manure, in fertilizer 2.6. Atmospheric deposition is minor on crop fixation. The total is 4.8. And 
the nutrient use efficiency, this ratio here is just 49%. If you take into account that there's some volatilization, I've learned that from these agricultural scientists, there's a lot of ammonium volatilization in stables and so on, then you maybe have a, have a, a utilization of 57%. So we spoil half of the nutrients and, and, agri and fertilizer we use in the catchment into the environment. So, what does it mean for the Baltic? I said before that, and we used here this very, this is the net anthropogenic nitrogen input on the, on the x-axis, and here's the river and load. A very robust relationship from the Baltic, China, northeastern US, midwest US. We have done that together with, with Dennis Sweeney, Bob Howarth, Bongi Hong, and many from, from, from our team. We see a very robust relationship that about 24, 20% of everything that we put in the catchment ends up in the sea. And this means now, again, I said we have a potential of 1 to 1.5 million tons. If we say a fifth of that, this is whatever, 2 to 300,000 tons or whatever nitrogen. This is much more than the, 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 the Baltic Sea Action Plan requires. And I don't, this is just a budget. And if we only do 20, 30 percent with a menu of 20, 30 percent, a better job of 20, 30 percent, we can easily fulfill the Baltic Sea Action Plan. And this is also, of course, then true for, for phosphorus. But here it is exemplified by nitrogen. OK, what are the solutions? And we have the solution that we, and this is not what the EU, EU wants. We, we, no, this is what the EU wants. We may, in the, in the circular economy, they want that we transport the manure from the, from, the, from the meat production areas to the crop production areas. But this is expensive and is done now in the Netherlands and northern Germany in some areas. And uh, what we also could do, we could have a more recycled and balanced um, agriculture with, with, with farms that have both crops and animals. This would be the easiest way. We could also reduce our, of course, diet consumption. We eat less meat, but the thing is that trade deals and these are the barriers, encourage the export of livestock products. And there's a strong growing global demand of livestock products. So if, if we don't eat that, that doesn't mean that the Baltic Sea is better, because then the farmers will sell it to China. So this is, this is, this is what we do. So we have to reduce the livestock. And then there's a low awareness of these environmental and health issues. And then, and this is really very difficult, because on the EU scale, the Baltic Sea catchment is not a hotspot because it is, it is a very sensitive system. It has a long residence time. But as, as you've seen before, in, in Britain or in um, Normandy or in the Netherlands or in northern Germany, the, the surplus is even higher than in these areas, but they have a less sis sensitive system. The water residence times in the North Sea is three months. That's why the Brits can say the solution to pollution is dilution. And, this, we cannot do that. We cannot afford that. But this is, of course, if you're on a use scale, then argue with a farmer in Poland why he, has to, he cannot use so much fertilizer as a farmer in Belgium. It will be a little bit difficult, but this is a political thing that, that has to be solved. Okay, there, but on the challenge, I think it is a global challenge because these numbers are, interestingly, pretty much the same. We only use about half of the nutrients we put on the field we get, get back at, at, at crops. But we should do it with uh, something like 80%, which is possible in countries like Denmark and northern Germany. In the recent years, we have reached it with these techniques at hand. But I think this is really something what we could do for, to, to have a better um, ecosystem state in the Baltic. OK, now I leave the, the, the catchment, and I want to say something about the ecosystem responses. because. The thing is, again, this picture. We have done so much, and we, we are talking about the Baltic Sea Action Plan, and we are best in the class, and we do everything we do. But the thing is that can we distinguish between the shifted baseline, select response, or natural variability? Because the system responds so slowly. And many people ask us, is, is the Baltic Sea better now? Mm, yeah, a little bit. But it is on the right path, we say. But it is not fast reacting because of residence times. And this is, of course, in terms of political timescales of one legislation period, difficult to, 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 to uh, convey. And <clears throat> it's still, this is the last uh, state of the Baltic Sea. After all these efforts, this is just red. And of course, this is not fun to show 
to, to the public. We have done all these things. But as Daniel said, in the Delaware, you had a fast response because of the system of the short residence time. Here we have a slow response. So this is the, the, the summary of, of this uh, eutrophication assessment. And this is something that, that uh, Jacob introduced, uh, these kinds of external phosphorus loads. It starts in 72 with about 20,000 tons. This is now the Baltic proper. And we had about 1.5 um, uh, m uh, microgram chlorophyll. Then, of course, we go up here in the trajectory and we double that due to eutrophication. Now we start stopping eutrophication, but we have the same levels because we have these long lag times. And we, we are not at the target. And this is very difficult to convey to the people. And now we come to the next step. Why is that so? It is due to legacy. And I also want to make it, I hope to explain this legacy issue also to the people here that working the agencies, but especially politicians, because it is very often misunderstood. So first of all, legacy pools, the biggest legacy pools on phosphorus is on land. So this is just a new figure of a policy brief we bring out now, and this is by, based on the Global Biochemical Cycles uh, article by Michelle McCracken. We have accumulated something like 40 million tons of phosphorus in the catchment. And they sit in agricultural fields, land fields, they sit in uh, lake, air, lake bottoms, 40 million tons. This is 20 times as much as we accumulated in the sea. So this is the big elephant and not the sea. But first of all, this is what, what, uh, what we did. And by that, our model tells us 33% is background load. This is the background load from forests and so on. 45% is his legacy. 14% is easily to fix because this is runoff from cropland and sewage. So we could do it by ditching or whatever and 8% is direct point sources. This legacy pool, there might be things how to manage that, and this might be cropping techniques, well, this is not my field, but I think we can also try to improve that. But this is a legacy we have built on land, and we have to think about how to make it less leaky. So, now we go, and this is a little bit more complicated, this legacy pea pools in the Baltic Sea, again. Here on land, 40 million tons have accumulated. We put in about something like 30,000 tons goes in and 3,000 tons goes out. In the water column, the increase over the last 50 years is about half a million ton has accumulated in the water column. And something like 1.6 million tons has accumulated in the surface sediments. And this is a very unsafe number, but this is what our models tells us. And then there's, of course, um, a permanent sick. But then, and we will go back to this later because it is based on Daniel's and our publication 2002, there's a release when it's, when it's anoxic of this, of, and they call it internal load. And now comes the misunderstanding of many politicians. Many people think that this is a continuous load that every year comes in, and this is wrong. It is not every year coming in. It is a pool that has been accumulated. Here are back on this uh, famous publication where we had a very nice weekend, Daniel and uh, Frederick and Oleg and many others, uh, here in the, in the archipelago. And here we see again what we've seen before. The anoxic area, 70,000 uh, square kilometers, goes, time, goes down, it is refreshing, so the halocline goes down. And then it comes the, 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 the major inflow, the halocline goes up again. So it is a short breath here, it takes, but then it is oxygen deficient again. But what we see here, this is the change of hypoxia, this is a change, so this is a delta, versus a change in the DRP pool. We see in some years it is a positive, up to 100,000 tons is released from the sediments, but in some years it's a negative. It says minus, minus uh, 100,000 tons, so it goes up and down. But politicians very often think internal load is a continuous thing. It's not. It is, goes up and down, and it's not fair, what many people do in this discussion, that the dynamics of a pool, of this internal pool of, let's say, 2 million tons, which has accumulated over the last 100 years, is compared to an annual flux of rivers. This is misleading and does not help the discussion. And, but this is the background for that. Again, that's why people think we, have to, we can do uh, sea-based measures and geoengineering. Let's bubble the system. And this really has only been discussed in Sweden and Finland. I think if we are bring up this in Germany, they just laugh. But, uh, I, because it's in the scale of... But there are other reasons for it, because I think it is, will not work. So this has been and tested and will be tested, and the agency still put money into that. But pumping it, bring more, uh, bring more oxygen into 
the system. You know, and we have now some, and we have seen this, this, this slide before, we can now test how efficient this, this is. And I'm really happy, Daniel, that you brought it up with the iron oxides, and maybe we don't have enough iron anymore because it's bound as pirate. We can now do a test now. In 2000, you have seen it before. The big inflow in 2014 was the biggest since 50 years, brought in 200 cubic kilometers of water, and this is four gigatons of salt. So you have to shovel a lot to bring in four billion tons of salt into the Baltic. And this is about half the total river Rhine runoff, or more than all the Swedish rivers bring into the Baltic Sea. A lot of water. If you want to pump that mechanically, you can imagine how much that costs. But did it have an effect? It was oxygenated water. We see it here, the salinity. You've seen it again. Oxygen, nitrate, phosphate. Stagnation period, we had heard before that here, 93 comes an in, in input, then we see oxygen comes in, nitrate comes in, phosphate is precipitated, partly. This works also in 2003, partly. Now the latest one, there's a big inflow here, the biggest one, oxygen is not as much as it had been before because maybe there's enrichment of organic matter. Nitrate comes in and phosphate goes, is less. And I ask Oleg, who is the, the wizard of all these um, dust systems that we have in our, our system, to interpolate all the stations here in the central Baltic Sea. And we have done that a week, a week ago. And these are all, this is not models, these are observations, modeling. This is observations for monitoring stations, no model. What this does is it extrapolates or interpolates the, the, the annual mean phosphate stock in the water column over a year and in, at all the, in, in, in the entire basin. And here are the results. We had before the inflow 419,000 ton, uh, tons of phosphate, uh, then 412, and then comes the inflow, it slightly increases. So if this hypothesis of ventilation would have been some, would make some sense, now we have aerated the system for three or three, four months, and we don't ha see hardly any effect. And I think, Daniel, we have to write a paper about that, because if this hypothesis with the iron and so on, but this, I think, is a proof nothing happened. And I hope that we don't have to, because this discussion about bubbling, it, it continues and continues and continues and comes up again. And I think, these are really strong, strong indications that at least now this will not work. You can argue, let's bubble the system 20 years and then maybe the iron comes back. But I think this geoengineering is just a crazy idea to sum that up. Okay. Okay. Again, how can we then, in a better way, uh, portray now success again? We still have the frustration that... Um, we have done a lot, the nutrients goes down here, the waterborne sources. And this is now a summary uh, of the model results from Eric Gustafsson, not Bo Gustafsson, no, this is from Eric Gustafsson from 2017. And this is now displayed as a budget. It's model results, and I don't say that all, especially the sediment part, is the best parameterized. But what this indicates is that we had a um, peak in loadings from the waterborne sources. This is for phosphorus now. We have here the net accumulation because something goes in, but we have also export to the North Sea and we have burial in the sediments. They have the losses. But we, what, what we see here, we have a net accumulation that continued about 2000. But from here onwards, at least what the model indicates, and we have to dig further into that, we enter a depletion phase. And somebody of you have said before, maybe the conditions are almost there, but we don't accumulate anymore. And if we, if we now, for example, look at the climate change debate, everybody talks about peak CO2. We have to reach peak CO2 in 2025 uh, of this uh, budget of gigatons of CO2 to reach the two, two degree goal. I think this is easier to show that we go from a loading to a depletion phase, that this is really success what we achieved, than steering us blind on a target of the Zeki depth that we, that, that we think was, was true 50 years ago and will be, and we thrive it again in 50 years. The ecosystem with the climate change will not be the same. So I think that these targets that we often used in the Water Framework Directive, and there's, there's a tool to describe how, well, what was the situation, let's say, 100 years ago. Good enough. But we cannot just 
think that this target, and this is very often done in the Water Framework Directive and so on, we will reach in 50 years. I think maybe portray success more. We, we have loaded the system for, let's say, 50, 60 years until the year 2000. And now sl we slightly come into the depletion phase. We are on the right track. I think this might be a better way to convey these management issues and that the Baltic Sea is on a better way. How it unfolds in terms of ecosystem, nobody knows, not even Alf knows. Uh, what, what critters there will be, we don't know that. No. Okay, and then, and this is also for a very nice um, publication from Jacob Valve and his team in the Himmafjärden here, we see also really rapid and very uh, constant improvement here in nearshore area. So every focus very much on the central Baltic. But here we see the decrease in phosphate loads in uh, the upper water column and the down and lower water column. We see also that these systems are more or less imbalanced, which means they receive phosphate, transform it in summer into a bloom which sinks to the bottom, then it might be gone a little bit sub in the sediments and then it's released again. And we see also the oxygen concentrations here. They are low, but not, of course, it is about above this 4.6 or what was it, milliliters per liter. But of course, with climate change, the, the, meta, the, the, the ecosystem metabolism will increase. And this is also, and we have seen it again, I think it was very nice that Jacob showed it, and also Alf showed it, and he gave me this picture because I think we have also to convey, this is near Twermen in, in Helsinki, on the other side here of the archipelago, the, the coastal systems are really beautiful and they are worth fighting for. And we also should show sometimes these really nice pictures where we have these this, this, this fantastic ecosystems with uh, seaweeds and fucus and so on. And I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's a really fantastic picture. And I think we, it's also part of our job to convey that the Baltic Sea is looking like that. So uh, the conclusions from my talk is I think the Baltic Sea Action Plan is a success story and may serve as a blueprint for many other areas. And I think also within the EU and within OSPAR, within many other uh, regional conventions, they are well aware about that. And I think that we can, with our knowledge, especially how the scientific community worked via HELCOM with the politicians, I think it was really a, a success story. And we shouldn't be shy to, to, to bring this to the other places. We have still, and this is often debated, a huge, we can increase the nutrient use efficiency on land. Because, as I said before, 50% of all we put on the field is just spilled. And we can do a better job, and we have examples for it. It may cost something, and we have the solution in hand, but I think this is a political, political decision. Again, I don't think that from the last inflow, what we have learned here, there is no quick fix for the Baltic Sea. You, 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 it is, the, these, if we pump it and, and oxygenate it, we've seen it. This has, it is more complicated than that. It is not just a fallen vital approach where you have P input and chlorophyll will come out. It is iron involved, many other, other biogeochemical plexes. If you don't have that at hand, we, we just cannot just suggest invest huge amounts of money in, into, in, into, into crazy things like this. And again, I think for the, how, how, do we, how, how do we convey that? There is no way, no way going back. So we cannot just use these targets in terms of, of, of Zeki depth or chlorophyll or what, whatever variable we choose, within 100 years, and these are the time scales exactly also what Daniel said, or 50 years it will take to recover the system, and we, re, and we refer to a period 50 years ago, we cannot expect that the, that the system is the same. So I think maybe the concept of loading depletion phase that, uh, that is used in the climate debate, we are not accumulating anymore, we are depleting the system. And I know that these models might have pros and cons, but I think budget-wise they are on the right track. Might be a better way to show success than say, okay, have we reached two centimeters better, better transparency? Man, this is kind of, this is not operational. I think maybe this, this depletion and, uh, is, is, is more important. Okay, I think with that I would like to thank you again, and uh, I hope that we have a bright future for the Baltic. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.